quick second. Recording is on. Okay. So uh, Mike's going to talk about the seven things he wishes he knew about Jamstack a year ago. Um, I got a little sneak peek of the slides. There's some really interesting stuff in this talk. So I'm super excited. I think it'll do a good job covering, you know, not only what is Jamstack and some of the beginner concepts, but also some really interesting things around performance and frameworks and things like that. So I'm super excited. Uh, thanks so much for uh, prompting us to get this thing going, Mike. Um, really appreciate you being proactive about it. So go ahead and take it away. Right on, yeah. Uh, thank, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, uh, is, this deck could get a little lengthy, so uh, please, uh, anybody just jump in. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat or just interrupt me if you have any questions. I think that's more interesting than me monologuing uh, for you know, 30 minutes or whatever. Um, <laughs> so please, please do that. But, um, um, but yeah, a little quick, just a quick introduction. Um, Mike Jerokas, uh, I, I used to work as a market researcher uh, for Forrester Research. Let me see if I can bring this tab a little bit bigger. Um, well, it's fine. I've got my glasses on. Uh, it, it basically, I, I used to do market research for banks, insurance companies, um, kind of focused on, you know, what's the best like mobile banking app um, or like digital strategies um, for, for larger companies. Um, th then I left uh, a few years ago, I started a, a, a business called Stowaway to help people save for travel as an iOS app. Um, but this is where I kind of started to do a little bit more development, um, teach myself from, from really the ground up. Um, I think I went through like three uh, like courses of like UD Udemy, uh, Udacity, maybe I did like a course there, like just a bunch of like online courses that were super helpful for me. Um, and then I, as like a side project, I started a web app uh, called the User Interview Exchange, um, which is like a side project where basically um, you can sign up and um, say you want to get user feedback from some segment of users. You post your request and people say, hey, like I have that expertise. Um, I can help you out with that and it kind of connects you. I built that with uh, Tailwind, uh, TypeScript, Firebase, Next.js, um, and then Contentful um, as the headless CMS there. And that was kind of my real first like dive into the Jamstack, uh, though I didn't know that's what it was. Um, and then now I work at a company called Netlify, um, which uh, the, the founders of Netlify kind of founded the term Jamstack. Um, and it's it's a... Uh, web development platform where a lot of folks who develop on uh, a Jamstack architecture, you know, deploy your sites. Um, at Netlify, I still do like a lot of code. Um, I do, I'm a marketing manager, but um, a lot of, you know, kind of tools that I use and uh, testing stuff out and kind of building templates and stuff like that for our clients um, still use Tailwind, TypeScript, Firebase, Next, um, Contentful, obviously I use Netlify. Um, but kind of getting into like more advanced use cases that we're usually working on, like um, personalization, internationalization, things like that. Um, I would not say I'm advanced at all. I would say I'm intermediate, um, but I, I happen to be around a lot of people who are advanced. So <laughs> sometimes I can talk about things um, that are, that are uh, a little out of my wheelhouse. So, so what, why do this talk? Um, one, I want you to have the best possible experience with the Jamstack. Um, uh, when I was doing it, there was like a lot of stuff I had to like learn the hard way. Um, and I don't want you to have to go through that. Um, the promise of the Jamstack is to make it faster to develop uh, and iterate sites and then make those sites faster. Like this whole reason people use uh, Jamstack architecture. Um, so uh, I learned some things this past year that would have made it faster for me to develop these sites. Uh, and then my sites would have been faster. So ultimately, you know, how can I? I kind of give back, you know, what I learned over the past year, year and a half um, to help you, you know, build sites faster that, and then have your sites perform better. Uh, and then finally, like when I was starting my business, um, like a lot of people just all over the community in Boston and anywhere else, like were really, really helpful to kind of just like help me out whenever I asked for help. Uh, and, and I'm kind of on a crusade now to, to, to give back <laughs> any way I can or pass it on. So uh, hopefully, hopefully this is helpful for, for you. Um, and if you have any other questions like after this or anything like that, please hit me up. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to um, answer any questions anytime. Um, so the seven things uh, I wish I knew what Jamstack is, uh, some Jamstack versus non-Jamstack friendly frameworks, um, uh, where data like stuff gets pulled in and then what should go where, 
uh, and a couple false starts, I would say. Uh, I would say that site speed matters uh, and a few optimizations can make a big difference. Um, I really kind of I thought that like, oh, site speed's like, that'd be nice, but I have to focus my time on other things, even though it would have taken, you know, two, three hours of my time to significantly improve the performance of my sites. Um, how to use build hooks uh, to update my website from Contentful. Uh, the, what I'm gonna share here, you can use with like any headless CMS, uh, not just Contentful, but as just a very specific example, Contentful being uh, kind of the, the most popular headless CMS out there, which is why I chose it. Um, uh, using component libraries, Tailwind CSS, I'm kind of a super fan, but uh, um, there's obviously lots of other component libraries that we see like Chakra, um, uh, material, bootstrap, et cetera, which are all kind of different. Uh, and then how to work with analytics tags. I say in Next.js, a lot of my work is on Next.js, but a lot of these apply to uh, really any framework that you end up uh, choosing. Uh, so first of all, I, I wish I knew what, what the Jamstack is. So I built a few sites um, that we're using. Um, kind of this Jamstack architecture, the, the stowaway marketing site, um, my the user interview exchange, which is that web app I was talking about, and then my, my personal site, uh, were all like Next.js uh, sites, but I didn't actually know what the Jamstack was. I just kind of Googled around what everybody's using. Um, so taking a step back, like um, I just want to kind of level set, like what is the Jamstack? Um, and the definition, uh, having worked at uh, Netlify and Netlify kind of created the term, the Jamstack, the definitions changed. Uh, it's actually changed a few times since the original, maybe even more than a few times. The latest one is, is the, the, the short of it is it's an architectural approach um, that separates the front end uh, from the back end. Um, and basically just to make it easier to code your front end without having to change all your databases or anything along those lines. Um, the other benefit being, you know, the performance. That's how I would summarize it. There's a longer definition, but, you know, uh, to me, I don't know how relevant this will be to other folks, but as someone who's developed, um, uh, I, th I think you can kind of contextualize it. Um, like as someone who's developed uh, iOS mobile apps, I kind of think of the Jamstack kind of like this. So for example, when you develop a mobile app, uh, let's just take an, an iOS app, you code the front end, but you connect to a database somewhere else, right? To bring in that data. Then when you're ready to ship it off to customers, you stick it in the app store. If you want to make a change to that front end UI, you pull down the code again, code it, and then you ship it off to the app store. Um, that's kind of how it kind of helped me contextualize like what's the jam stack. There's a front end code and then there's back end APIs that you pull in um, just when you need them. Uh, the, the problem, another, another problem, number two, that I encountered um, is that I didn't really choose uh, the most jam stack friendly framework. Um, so when I first created my web app, um, the whole web app was created using create react app or just kind of like vanilla react. Um, and that's great for oftentimes like a dashboard or something like that. Um, but you miss out on a lot of the potential for speed improvements. Um, and so I realized that there's, you know, some other frameworks that actually could, uh, could really improve the speed of the site. Um, which is important because I had blog posts there. It wasn't just like a dashboard. I also had the marketing site on it. Um, and yeah. Um, and so I would have chosen a Jamstack friendly framework because uh, there are these things called core web vitals. I don't know if everybody's familiar, but uh, the short of it is um, Google has said, if you provide a better web experience for customers that come to your site, um, we're going to rank you higher in uh, search results uh, than someone who has similar content. Um, so these, uh, these really, really matter. Um, and I can tell you, uh, someone who talks to uh, like kind of larger customers um, using the Jamstack on a pretty regular basis, uh, it's, a, it's a big priority for these folks uh, lately. Um, and so I'll dive into what each of these uh, kind of core web vitals are, but one of them is called uh, uh, largest contentful paint, which is basically how fast your site is to load the largest thing. Um, some frameworks I could have chosen at the very beginning um, when I, instead of just the create react app, um, which wasn't as fast because it was rendering everything straight on, uh, on the client, um, were, let's see, 
uh, Vue, Gatsby, Nux. Gatsby and Nux are kind of the most two, two popular ones we see. Jekyll, Hugo, um, Jim, whatever uh, y'all, y'all are developing p- potentially uh, or, uh, as a build system over there. Uh, Preact, Vite, Svelte, you know, there's a whole bunch of these. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a running joke uh, that uh, so, someone at Nellify says oftentimes he, he, he interviewed someone and said, well, what do you think about the latest JavaScript framework? Uh, and, and the, the candidate said, I don't know, I've been on vacation the last three weeks. The, the, the whole point of this is that like, there's, there's a lot of these, uh, and they're, they're kind of popping up all the time. Um, uh, but the, the three we see most frequently, um, are Next.js, uh, Nuxt and Gatsby. Um, I took a look at this graph when I was developing this stuff and I said, okay, looks like Gatsby used to be really popular. Uh, used to be the most popular, but like next is starting to kind of run away when you just look at this, the scope of these three here. So personally, I chose Next.js. Uh, what I don't include there is like these, like the, the, the newer ones that are kind of, there's, there's some, uh, they're gaining steam, like, uh, like Astro is gaining a lot of steam lately. Um, the, the, the founder of Eleventy works actually some of the marketing team at Netlify. He used to work on the marketing team. He used to develop Netlify.com. Um, we created a framework called Levendi that's pretty popular. Um, the next, the next thing that I wish I had learned was where stuff gets pulled in and 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 what should go where. Um, so this is a problem because uh, first, I client side rendered everything using just kind of create React app, um, but that was pretty slow. So and it wasn't great for search engine optimization at the time. Google had a tough time. Um, uh, supposedly had a tough time indexing pages that were client side rendered. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll just server side render everything using Next.js um, where everything gets built on the server and then it gets sent to the uh, to, to your browser, uh, to the client. Um, but that actually, uh, you know, that's better for uh, Google being able to read it, but it's still pretty slow. And then eventually um, uh, I, I statically generated ever, as much as I could everything. I would have started probably at step three had I known um, the, the, the following. Um, so with modern frameworks, there's there's a few different ways that you can um, kind of generate this content or render this content. Um, and this chart is just to show that, you know, Next.js, Nox, and Gatsby, three of the most popular ones that we see uh, or I see frequently or our clients is... Um, uh, that they each have pretty much have server side rendering, static generation, uh, and then something fancy called like incremental deferred generation. There's a bunch of other names for it. Um, so just a brief overview of what each of these are. So oftentimes, if you're rendering things server side, um, say I'm in Boston and I want to get the website back from a server that's in Virginia. Every time I want to get that, I, it's got to go all the way to Virginia, and then it's got to do all that work on the server to build your entire page, um, and then to turn your page from React components into or from JavaScript into HTML, and then it sends it back to Boston. Same thing if you're in Sydney, it goes all the way back to you know your origin server in Virginia, um, does all that work again. Which is maybe it's like, it's like takes you know a second and a half to do all that work, and then send it sends it back to Sydney. Um, another way, so generating everything statically, basically you push up content to a build server. This is oftentimes what we think of when we think of Jamstack is like, like this just statically generating everything, push it to the build server, takes two or three minutes, and then it pushes it out to a CDN. Uh, if you want to make a change, just like a mobile app, uh, you got to build it again. So push it to the server and then it pushes out. That's really good because, um, you know, CDN has edge nodes everywhere. So for example, I'm in Boston, the closest one to me is in New York. It's already done all that work. Remember that like second and a half that that server used to take to turn all the JavaScript into HTML. It's already done all that work. So it doesn't need to do that. It just needs to send it right back to me. Um, and it's closer because it's on a CDN. Same thing in Sydney. Like there's a node out in Sydney. Um, it's a lot closer. It doesn't need to go back to this origin server. And the reason you don't like just um, generate everything on each of those CDNs is um, until recently you, 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 you couldn't. Um, and then finally, there's this thing called 
Uh, it's kind of uh, called incremental uh, static uh, regeneration, deferred something, something from Gatsby and Next probably calls it something like that too. Um, but the short of it is uh, we see this in like clients that have like a lot, a lot of uh, pages. So for example, take like docusign.com. They have um, like, I don't know, like 2,400 pages. If they were to statically generate all of those pages, um, even everything being optimized, it's probably going to take them about 10 minutes. Uh, and they also have a lot of like marketing people uh, that are pushing content regularly. And if they want to see like what the content's going to look like on like a staging um, or what it's going to look like in, you know, or, or, or they want to see what it looks like on production and they made a, they made a, um, a spelling error or something like that, it's going to take them like 10 minutes to wait to see that. So what a lot of these companies will do um, is... They'll just ship it straight to uh, the server. The first time the first visitor comes to the site, it generates it just like it would um, uh, statically. Sorry, just like it would on the server, it sends it back to them, but then it also builds it and distributes it to um, the CDN uh, or the edge so that the next person that comes to that page um, gets it as quickly as possible. Um, and then every subsequent person that comes to it after that uh, we'll get it directly from the edge. That way they avoid the massive build times, like the 10 minute build times. Um, and then like, so if there's a blog they published in 2019 that no one's gonna read in the next four hours before they push another change, they don't even bother building it. It's kind of the niche niche thing. Um, but like where data gets pulled in. Um, so let's take an example of my web app. Please excuse the poor design. Um, uh, the top in green is all stuff that's static, like the actual buttons, the links there, the logo, <laughs> like so many nice colors. Uh, uh, <laughs> so the uh, green, static, good, fast. Um, the logo, you know, the header, that stuff's not going to change. But then in red, um, we've got all this kind of dynamic content. Uh, so for example, it's my user's balance, their token balance, um, you know, their status, their bio, um, what country they're from, et cetera. That's all kind of dynamic that the users are changing this. But then let's go to just the blog. This is userinterviewexchange.com slash blog. Uh, this content only changes when I push a blog post and I rarely push a blog post like once a month or I used to once a month. So really all this content is just is static. Uh, so ultimately um, what I should have done uh, which took me three steps to get there. I went from client side rendered to server side rendered. I should have uh, generated it statically. Uh, and then, you know, on the profile page, pulled in the dynamic data from my Firebase database, just the dynamic data that I needed. But that top header and everything else, as much as possible, uh, as much of the scaffolding as possible is statically generated. So then, for example, with the blog page, it was just distributed directly to the edge. Um, so those were a lot faster. And that was really important because my strategy was focused a lot around search engine optimization, high core web vitals, fast site. Um, so yeah, kind of supported that blog strategy. Uh, take a, does, does anybody have any questions at this stage while I get into the, the fourth thing that I wish I had learned about Jamstack? Okay. <laughs> um, so it, w w one of the problems um, that I had was that um, my site could have been even faster. Even though I statically generated as much as possible, uh, my site could have been faster. Uh, and like I mentioned, this is better for Core Web Vitals uh, and for search engine optimization. So Core Web Vitals is um, kind of what I mentioned earlier. Google is saying, you know, if you, you provide a better experience for users, then uh, they're going to they're going to rank you a little bit higher than folks who have similar uh, content on their website. Largest contentful paint. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, cumulative layout shift is uh, so if you've ever, ever gone to a site and then the banner loads a few seconds later and like the whole site moves uh, or like a pop up comes up uh, out of nowhere or um, a cookie compliance banner pops up from the bottom and kind of like moves stuff around on the page. That's called a cumulative. That's called a layout shift. And as you know, you've probably experienced, it's not a very good experience for users. Uh, and Google measures that, how much stuff shifts around when it's loading. The more stuff shifts around, the lower your, uh, the, the 
the worse your cumulative layout score is, uh, and therefore the, the worse your um, core web vitals are. Uh, first input delay is basically when you click a button, uh, it should react within 50 milliseconds. Um, and then if it if it reacts in longer than that, that's kind of a that's that's a poor experience for the user because it feels like lag. Uh, so for example, there are some really long running JavaScript tasks that you probably have on your sites, like uh, Google Analytics, or if you stuff a bunch of stuff into Google Tag Manager, like we all do. Um, sometimes those can be really, really long running uh, processes that can disrupt the main thread and provide a poor uh, experience for folks just trying to click a button to go to the to go somewhere else on your site. Um, uh, largest contemptful pain is the one I'm going to talk about because um, it's very specifically related to you know the actual loading speed of your site uh, or the metric that Google cares most about for the loading speed of your website. Uh, it measures how long it takes for the largest thing on your page on your page to show up. Uh, so let's take uh, as a website I built for a friend. Uh, the largest thing on the page is this really large, way too big. <laughs> Uh, uh, image um, of like a, you know, what is it, like a doctor holding a light bulb or something uh, like that. Uh, so that's, that's, so Google's going to measure how long that takes to show up to the user uh, as a metric for how fast your, your site is loading. Cause it's, cause you're basically saying by putting something that big there, that like, this is an important thing for, for visitors. So they're gonna say, okay, how long did it take that for, to show up? Um, you can use the uh, Chrome development tools to check how long your uh, your uh, largest contemptful pane is. I prefer to use a tool called webpagetest.com. Uh, it's just like more transparent. I think it like summarizes things a lot better and pulls out a few details that um, Chrome dev tools don't yet today. And so for this website, uh, for example, it's, you know, uh, I had a largest contemptful pane of 2.6 seconds, um, which is a little bit outside the the recommended, which is like I think two point five seconds from uh, from go go what Google recommends. So my recommendation <laughs> to myself, I suppose, uh, would be to focus on bringing that down because my cumulative layout shift is almost nothing, and then that uh, total blocking time number uh, is, is is zero. There, there's there's nothing blocking the main thread, which means that my first input delay is totally fine. So how do you decrease the largest contemptful paint? Uh, one of the things you can do is decrease the time that it takes for everything before it. Um, and one of those things is the time it takes to uh, start getting information from the server edge or CDN, wherever it's getting it from. Uh, so let's take the example of you've got your largest image on the page. Uh, it can't start loading until it gets information back from, this, from, the, uh, from the edge. And let's say, it, without a CDN, it takes like 700 milliseconds. It's not uncommon for it to go from, you know, from California all the way to a server in like, uh, let's say, uh, Virginia, where a lot of AWS servers are. Um, but with a CD with a CDN, uh, you can bring that time down to about like 100 milliseconds. So you didn't actually do anything anything to the largest image on the page, or the item that's the largest uh, on the page, but you just decrease all the time, the stuff before it. And there's a, oftentimes a few other things that are here, um, but with a CDN, basically you can bring that, you can knock off like, you know, depending on where it is, uh, up to like 600 milliseconds. Um, so we've kind of brought that down. Okay, great. Uh, the, the largest contemptful pane is still at, what's that? Like 2,200 milliseconds to 2.2 seconds for that image to show up. So we gotta start optimizing the actual image itself. Um, there's a few ways uh, that you can do this, and I'll go into each of them. Uh, but the short of it is, uh, if you're serving PNG images or JPEG images, uh, those are slow. Uh, you should probably be serving WebP or AVIF images. Uh, those are good. Those are much um, faster. So on the left is, um, is a, a friend of mine, Colby Fayok. He uh, works for a company called Cloudinary. So before he uh, added Cloudinary in, he was serving everything in JPEG. And then on the right side is after he's using a service. Um, you know, the amount of time that it takes to load each uh, in AVIF and the amount of, and the size of the actual elements coming through is just way smaller. Um, I think it's like 
I, I can't see her here, but I think it's it's probably like five to ten times smaller, um, just by optimizing um, the uh, the file format of the image itself. Not even optimizing like the the um, oftentimes not optimizing the size of the image either. So how do you uh, optimize these images? Well, you can use built-in framework components. All the major ones have them. Um, Next.js, Nuxt, um, Gatsby. Basically, you just wrap it in their kind of like image component and it makes all those decisions for you. So you don't have to say, oh, this is a WebP image. This is an AVIF image if it's a Safari browser or it's a, um, you don't have to make any of those decisions really. Uh, if you're not using one of those, uh, another way to do it is use a service, or if you want to take a step further is to use a service like Cloudinary, um, a little bias here, but there's, there's plugins on Netlify. I'm sure there's plugins on lots of other platforms, but basically, uh, the way it works on the Netlify platform is like you, um, install this build plugin, um, and it takes all your images when you build the site, sticks them up into Cloudinary and then brings them back down, um, and then brings them back down from Cloudinary and optimized sizes and uh, and 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 formats. Jesse, do I prefer Cloudinary image optimization optimization over Next Image? Uh, because I use Next.js, I I, th I use the Next.js uh, image component. Um, it's Cloudinary. I would say if you want to take like the next step with optimizing images and like really like ch choose like. Um, the exact kind of size for every little browser and like uh, um, how much lossy compression you're like, I don't know, how much, how much you're willing to lose for, for more compression, how much um, clarity you're willing to lose for more compression. I'd use like something like Cloudinary, but for most of us who aren't building like massive scale image heavy sites, I would just use the built-in framework components like next image. Um, uh, at Netlify, I think our, um, Netlify.com, like our marketing site is on like 11 uh, the 11 framework. Um, and we use the kind of built in picture element. Um, I, I believe that's what we use. Uh, basically it's a built in element where you can say, you can upload images in AVIF, WebP, JPEG, there's like Moz something um, and, and tell the browser to pick whatever's best for that browser. The downside of that is that it's a lot of manual effort of having to create each of those formats and then uploading it to your, um, up, uploading it to your, um, to your site. Uh, and then the last one I added this one in here because uh, it appeals to my heart, but not necessarily the sensibilities. Uh, you could just be lazy and just use WebP for everything. Um, uh, I've I've done it before, and like a I, I use a site builder to build a site for a friend who wasn't super technically advanced um, and, but speed mattered for him a lot. He's a, he's a social media influencer. And so um, I ended up just using WebP uh, for everything. Now it's only going, it's not going to work with like internet explorer, um, but it will work for 97% of the population of the world. I, I don't recommend it unless it's like a very specific use case. Like you're building a site for a influencer whose audience is only on iPhones and um, and Jesse, just like you uh, asked, I, so for my side, my, myself, I ended up optimizing the image using, um, the built-in framework component. Um, I meant to show the comparison here, but basically it brought it down to like a third of the size, um, and, and brought my core web vitals, but we'll have to see, but it brought the, it brought the, um, synthetic monitoring of them, uh, my, uh, largest contemptful paint down significantly. Um, so the next mistake uh, I made that that I think might hopefully save save y'all uh, some time. Right, the jam stack should be fast to develop and iterate, uh, and this is one of those ways that it, I was it was slower for me, and I had to figure out how to do it uh, faster. And uh, my processor was kind of slow for every time I wanted to update my website um, from Contentful. So what I mean, Contentful is a headless CMS, um, and it's where I write my blog posts for um, a couple of my sites. Um, but my process for getting those, uh, blog posts live was I had to go back into the code and merge some changes into master, which was oftentimes I'd have to like, just like change a period somewhere, or change something really, really small. Uh, and, and it has nothing to do with actually my content. 
Um, then we'd have to update the, the app and run the build, uh, Netlify and Next.js. Uh, then it would get the content from Contentful um, and then deploy it to the edge. Uh, the problem here is I was updating my content in Contentful. Why did I have to go all the way back to my code to make a tiny change and then trigger a build? I, I also could have just gone straight into the uh, Netlify UI and just said redeploy site, but I shouldn't have to leave Contentful.com to do that. Um, so ultimately, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> basically every time I wanted to add a new blog post, I'd just like go into the UI or make a really small change uh, to trigger a new new deploy, but that would require having to take me out of my workflow and make a bunch of uh, uh, take a lot more time, and it should be really fast to iterate these things. Um, so eventually, uh, I discovered only recently, probably within the past six months, like there's like pre-built integrations with like almost every headless CMS, um, and so you can set up. I, I keep coming back to the example, I'm a little bias, obviously with Netlify, um, but the same thing with Gatsby Cloud. I'm sure Vercel has some solution for it as well. Um, and uh, basically it just plugs right into your headless CMS and it's a button that you can press straight from the headless CMS to redeploy your site. Um, it actually even gives you an update on like when the last time it was built and like if it's if it's still building in progress. Uh, this was pretty helpful for me when I was, you know, not, not having to like leave my workflow uh, to make all those changes. Uh, it, it gets exponentially more helpful when it's like you and someone else, or like say you're building a site for a client and they don't really care what a headless CMS is at all. And um, just giving them a button to press right in their UI is, uh, and that they can easily see what's going on is, is, is massively helpful. Um, component libraries. Uh, so in my opinion, like one of the major advantages of the Jamstack uh, is that like literally anything you want to design has already been designed before and you can probably just Google around and find it. Uh, I didn't do that. I went the hard way and was like, ah, I think I can do this better. Uh, and I was absolutely wrong and designed a terrible looking uh, web app. Um, so I wish I had known a lot more about component libraries. Uh, the one that I'm a huge fan of is Tailwind CSS, um, but there's you know Bootstrap, Material UI, I've seen Ant Design a lot. I don't know a lot about it. Um, uh, what's another one I've seen? Um, Chakra. Uh, but any of these like, kind of component frameworks, I think the beauty of like the Jamstack is basically being able to grab these from anywhere. There's tons and tons of these libraries. Um, it's kind of modular, right? Whereas like uh, take a WordPress template or something like that, it's not as perfectly modular in my experience, even if you're using like Divi or something along those lines. Um, and component libraries, like, yeah, so I talked about Tailwind, just Google around, there's like a million out there. Um, you know, they, they've got the official Tailwind components. Uh, Headless UI is, a, is one that a lot, a lot of teams use, which is basically pre-built components like dropdowns. So I, I don't know about you, I spent like a way more time than I ever want to creating dropdown menus uh, in the Jamstack. And they have them like pre-built there. And the best thing about them is they're not only pre-built, but they're accessible. Because uh, creating a dropdown is a pain. Creating an accessible dropdown is a huge pain, uh, especially if it gets more complex. And, and then there's a million other component libraries. And also, say you like something on a website and they're using Tailwind CSS, which we're seeing, probably shouldn't give out the number, but a lot, a lot of sites are using Tailwind these days. You can just open it up and steal whatever they have for Tailwind in, uh, uh, in, in, their, in their code that comes through. And this is a site that yeah, I borrowed from, or I purchased actually from the Tailwind team. Um, and you can just kind of like, people can just go in and look at what, whatever utility classes they're using. Uh, but the core, the core uh, reason behind this is like, Jamstack should be faster to develop on, using component libraries uh, should, should be you know, super easy. Um, super fan of Tailwind. Um, I don't know why I'm trying to sell you on it so hard, but I am. Uh, it's it's growing in popularity. So the top there, I think, is Bootstrap, and as you can see, it's probably gonna uh, take over Bootstrap pretty soon, and um, and much more popular than what's the other one, Material UI. Uh, finally, um, this one's a little bit more niche, but I think it's fun, and I, I worked on it last night um, to see how easy it actually is to integrate. 
Um, so how to work with analytics tags in Next.js or really any framework you use. Um, so I had an issue where uh, integrating Google Analytics, it was like a little bit of a pain. But the thing is, it wasn't super difficult, but it, like it slows down your site. So if you look at, uh, I was talking about the first input to first input delay or also total blocking time. So basically um, when someone presses a button, how long does it take to react? If you have really long JavaScript running processes, sometimes that can get in the way of it. And the really common ones you see is teams who have like tons of um, like tags in Google Tag Manager. Um, it can really start to um, uh, weigh heavily on the user's browser. Um, and so there's kind of a new way that some folks are starting to do it, which is uh, an application called Party Town. Um, which basically moves everything off of the browser and onto a, a worker. Uh, so here's an example of uh, my site last night. Um, it's actually on the left there is that same site that I was showing that had like the big picture. Um, oh, there's proof that the largest contentful paint came down by one second. Um, but the total blocking time when I just had integrated Google Analytics uh, last night it went up to 479 milliseconds, which isn't great. And then I installed Party Town on it um, and it immediately brought it down to uh, 198 milliseconds, which brings it kind of into a more uh, reasonable amount of total blocking time. The best part about this is that like, I only have one tag in there, but if you look at a lot of sites, um, I'm trying to think of some like Heap.io, it's an analytics company and they have like a million different um, uh, tags in their Google Tag Manager, um, you could they they could um, just offload those to a service worker like in the same strategy, and it wouldn't exponentially get higher. Um, pretty much every enterprise client I look at has like a total blocking time of over a full second, just because I mean in modern marketing, oftentimes you need like a million tags. That's just the way it works. Uh, and I think this is the last slide. Basically, the summary is uh, working with analytics tags. Uh, you can make your site a lot more performant by using a library like Party Town and offloading it, uh, and you you wouldn't be able to do that if uh, if it wasn't for the Jamstack. And uh, that's it. That's what I got. Are there any questions or anything that I can dive deeper or clarify? Or yeah, um, I'll just say first of all that was awesome, Mike. Thank you for sharing all that with us. Um, I feel like you managed to do an overview and a deep dive at the same time. That's really cool. <laughs> um, I I have questions. I can start it off. You, unless, Cap, did, did you look like you were coming on? Now? Okay. I'll no. start with the questions just in case. Um, sometimes people like to, to warm up a little bit. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to talk around definitions, Mike. So in the beginning, you were defining things and you, you mentioned that the you know, the term Jamstack has been redefined many times and changed. And actually, I didn't think I, I don't think I ever read that newest definition. I have a lot of questions about that specifically, yeah. but <laughs> it's funny how people define terms. So I was I was talking um, with, with a friend. He actually comes to all these meetups, uh, Anthony Campolo, about uh, full stack one time. And he, I define full stack as like anything that's running like a server code, essentially. And he's like, well, if it doesn't have a database, it's not full stack because he's thinking in terms of like, you know, like a lamp stack or the traditional stack. I thought it was funny that we, we were talking about like two kind of different things with just that simple concept. So in terms of Jamstack, um, I know you mentioned like a bunch of um, kind of different uh, like methodologies to like building sites, you know, client-side client, client side rendering, server-side rendering. Um, you mentioned ISR. And I'm curious, like, so ISR, um, would that be considered Jamstack? Because essentially you're, you have like a, a backend that has to do the build for the initial request that comes in. So I would think that that would automatically disqualify it from being a Jamstack. The only thing that makes it confusing is I feel like Netlify and Vercel, I don't know if they are, both are doing it, but they both support these applications that do that. So it, it's like taking a full stack app and making it seem like a Jamstack app. I don't know where you fall on that. Yeah, I think, um, so I have personal opinions. Uh, my personal opinion is that like, even to a degree, even like a server side rendered decoupled app is Jamstack. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, yeah, I, I, I would say so. Um, like, I think if you come back to the two tenants of like, like why 
teams start using the Jamstack? Like what's the reason you would actually choose to use this? One is that you want to be able to code faster, make changes faster. And then the other one is that, you know, you want your site to go faster. You want it to be more performant. That still solves the first component um, that you can code faster. Um, and it's and it's like, if you look at that definition, it's really focused on like decoupling the front and back end. Um, so I would actually even consider like, even take a step farther and be like, yeah, even if, if, if it's like Next.js server side rendered, like, but it's decoupled, um, I would consider it Jamstack. Um, yeah, I think decoupling being, I guess I just talked concerned, but I guess decoupling being like the, the major component. Um, and yeah, ISR being somewhere in the middle, right? Like it, yeah. So I got a couple points on that. So first of all, so I would, I think a lot of it for me, again, this is where I draw definitions might be different than you, but uh, server-side rendering could be Jamstack depending on when it takes place. And that's why I, I've personally been trying to move to these terms like um, on-demand rendering versus build time rendering. Because I think Jamstack is, sometimes gets muddy. I think SSR, CSR, that gets a little muddy. But if you talk about when it's built and how it's deployed, that to me seems more mm. clear, right? So it's like, so for, for instance, the, the, the project that we're working on, it, it does SSR, it does server-side rendering, but it does it at the build time and mm. then it deploys it. So you're never doing on-demand rendering. You're never getting a request and doing that rendering. So that, that's, yeah. that's one thing I, that I think about. Another thing I think about is like, okay, um, again, I'm, everything comes in terms of the project that we're working on, but we have this idea of uh, a get back CMS. And essentially what that is, is it's like a front end application that lives with your static hosted site. So that could be deployed on a CDN. And that's where your editing interface comes in. So it's not decoupled in that sense, right? It's actually coupled with your app versus like a headless CMS would be like a separate application with a JSON API or something like that. And so the editor goes with the site but the back end, I guess, is decoupled because the back end is a like a Git repository, right? So like that essentially is decoupled. I don't know where you fall on that. Like it, it, maybe we're not doing jam. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I think that's a great point. Like it's just, that it sounds like it, it's kind of like docs as code, whatever, which I guess is like pretty pretty similar concept. Like a lot of teams that write documentation now, they do this similar. Like they write in the marked at like in the files mm -hmm. uh, themselves and then bring them in. And um, so it's like not de decoupled. But then they do statically generate it and send it out. I, I don't know. And I, I, I think it all just comes back to like, what are you trying to achieve? You want you want to develop faster. You want to you want your site to go faster. Like, what's the best way to do that? Um, so, yeah, I, I try not to get hung up on on the on the intricacies of of. There's so much stuff because I didn't even get into like edge rendering stuff. Sure. Um, and there's like, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Is that like like the Redwood and Blitz model? Is that? Uh, I'm not super familiar with those, oh, but me either. I, I think I personally, we're starting to do. In my opinion, we're starting to do more on the edge mm -hmm. um, than ever before. And so, why can't you start to actually just build stuff on the edge when you need it and and do it really fast because we're getting faster computers? Like, um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, there's even distributed databases and stuff now. It's yeah. it's getting crazy what you can do. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll open the floor up to other folks who have questions, hopefully, or comments or. Jim, I'm, I'm upgrading you too. Hey, uh, Mike, this is Lucas. Yeah. Um, I guess my question that I want to ask you is what has been your biggest, I think in your quest of trial and errors when, um, when building these sites uh, you were presenting, what was your biggest trial and error and what was kind of the biggest takeaway you learned from it? Uh, it would probably like, if I actually took it, like how much time I spent on something that probably didn't need to be spent there. Um, I would probably say that like, the component library stuff, which isn't really stuff you generally think about when you think about like Jamstack, like what makes Jamstack good. But like, I probably get shaved off, honestly, like two weeks of my life. I could have saved two weeks of my life just if I just borrowed components from already existing people have built this application a hundred times over. Um, and if I just like spent like a day looking around for those, I could have saved a ton of time. Uh, so it's kind of a, yeah, that was probably the biggest one been in that boat before really <laughs> loved the presentation by the way oh cool thank you 
so Mike, you um you you built UX as as like a a project that um or a business that, that you were building at the time. Is that so that was your probably you you were foray into Jamstack for the first time. You maybe didn't even know the term Jamstack at the point. And did did that make you fall in love with the paradigms so much that it it drew you towards Netlify eventually like working at Netlify or what was that progression like for you? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um I think it was more like uh, I just like really like to code, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm probably a better marketer. Uh, and so there's only a few companies that I can do that at, uh, both like on a daily basis. Um, mm -hmm. and you're probably familiar with all of them. Uh, and so it's like, Hey, can I work for you guys? Nice. <laughs> and, and one of them said, yes. <laughs> so yeah. That's kind of how it worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, Nellify, I, I mean, obviously co coining the term jam and that's how we got involved in this in the beginning, but um, just so much of, of even like the project that, that we're working on is, is like, comes from ideas, you know, that, that are around this ecosystem. So, um, it, it's really cool to see all the innovation that happens there. So you're at the right place for sure. Um, I guess I had like, this is brass tacks. I, I was curious, you were talking about those, um, like the, the image components that like Next.js image component and that kind of thing. Are those actually generating the different formats for you? So are you basically uploading one format and then it's automatically generating a WebP and these other things for you like on build time. Is that what's happening? I don't know when it's happening. Yeah. I don't, um, there's still some stuff that I would, because I'm a medium jam stack guy, uh, yeah. not, not yet at the advanced level, uh, can't go into exactly how it works. Um, but yeah, you just upload, you know, an image, uh, as your normal PNG JPEG, whatever you have it as. Um, and then it just, it, it, uh, it makes that optimization for you and makes those decisions for you. Yeah. Did you by chance get a, it was only just what the day before yesterday, uh, Next.js had their, uh, their release 13. I don't know if you got a chance to watch their, their keynote or any of that. Do you have, have any particular thoughts on what, what's coming out of that? I know a lot of it is really kind of forward thinking. A lot of it was, well, this is in beta and not still going to change, but, um, but it, uh, it looked like, look, looked like they, you know, I mean, um, they, they're, you know, moving towards some some nice changes. I, I like some of the stuff. The uh, the new app folder uh, is going to make make you know like nested pages and whatnot a lot more clear. I think um, was was sort of a nice a nice change, and then allow you to only you know to not not have to um, uh, you know re redownload entire pages. Uh, you know, you you can just update the. Uh, the page components that you need and whatnot looks looks like looks like some potentially good stuff. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take to get all of that implemented, but um, uh, I don't know. I was just wondering if you had any any thoughts on on that in the, in the past forty eight hours. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, certainly, lots of people in my company do. Uh, <laughs> um, I uh, I'm not educated enough, honestly, to have enough thoughts. Um, I think it's I think it's super cool. I guess someone who does most of their development next.js um i think it's really interesting anything like new comes out um i yeah from what i understand it's like that the whole like reloading just components is feels a lot like remix to me yeah um, which is fine i mean cool like uh, um totally fine um the turbo turbo repo stuff um, right i if I'm being honest, like I've never worked on a big enough project where that's been an issue for me. Um, but I think for the people who it has, like you can imagine that being like a huge, huge annoying thing. Um, so it doesn't hit me as hard personally as, as other folks. Um, um, yeah, those are kind of my only yeah. kind of init initial thoughts. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of excited to, to try some of the stuff out, but I'm, a lot of it's still in beta so that, you know, it's not really stable. Um, yet so <laughs> I, I guess you know <laughs> it's gonna have to be more be be play right now I, I remember there was something something about optimizing fonts too that i yeah i actually i was really excited about that because last yeah. night I was, I was trying to figure out how to optimize my fonts mm -hmm. and like i was like I can't do this and i googled it and it was like just with next 13 where there's more font optimization i was like oh yeah <laughs> I'm a bit of a font nerd, so as soon as I heard I that, I, I got really excited. <laughs> I'm constantly trying to explore and, and work with and, and and try to be creative with fonts and typography. So, uh, so that was that was sort of good news. But it was it was a I mean it was a pretty I, I thought it was a pretty exciting um, uh, keynote actually. Um, so looking forward to that. I, yeah. I, I used to work in uh, like through college. I used to work in Apple stores, 
and we used to always sit down and watch all like the Apple keynotes. Uh, and like this very much felt like kind of like an Apple -y keynote. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, they had like an, an hour and a half of pre-show hype that was maybe a little over the top, but I, I was going, well, I could be doing some better. I kept like flipping back to see if they got anything real yet, but. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, um, we hit seven. Is there any last minute questions anyone wanna fire in? Okay, well, thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate you coming on and talking. Thank you for everyone for coming out. Um, this is awesome. I'll put the recording up as soon as I can, maybe tonight or tomorrow. Um, and uh, I'll post it on the meetup page and tweet it out. Yeah. Thank you all, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Mike, that was great. Thank you.